All right, are we good to go? Yeah. Okay. So welcome to the epifluorescence microscopy using Kian's BZX180 microscope. Um, I have kind of divided this presentation into three different parts. Um, in the first part, I'll give you kind of a background on the theory of the epifluorescence microscopy. Um, we'll brief you more about the technical features of Kian's and how it relates to the imaging we are doing and uh, the Kian's user interface so that you don't feel new or alien when you are on the microscope. And the third part is Kian's in action. I'll uh, put the standard sample that we have of BPA slide and I'll go over that sample and show everything I've discussed so far and how that relates to when Kian's is actually used, okay? So um, the goal of the microscopy is to acquire any fluorescent signal from cells or tissues. And the important part over here is that your cells and tissues are labeled with a fluorophore or any kind of fluorescent protein. And this in turn helps you to visualize any structure or structures uh, to address any kind of biological questions. So how is it that the fluorophore or the fluorescent protein works? Um, any of the fluorophore you have have got molecules which are in the resting S0 phase. Once they are excited um, through fluorescent light, these molecules which are in the resting state S0 gets up to the excited state S1 and this is a very short-lived state. The molecules cannot stay excited for a long time, and hence they undergo vibrational relaxation during which they give non-radiative energy transfer, and um, which essentially is fluorescence, and they again come back to the ground state as zero. Okay, so this is an example of a fluorophore like Alexa 488 or FITC or GFP in which you shine them with the blue light and they give um, emission in green uh, region. And this can be again understood with Stoke shift or fluorescent spectra. And though we keep on saying that, you know, I'm using my FITC or GFP or 488, which is or Alexa 488, which is 488 nanometer in excitation and phi 10 in emission, typically it's never that tight. What you will always see when you look at fluorescent spectrum is that your fluorophore has got broad excitation and broad emission. And hence, when you are multiplexing or using multiple fluorophores, it's important to kind of go onto a website like, um, or use a tool like fpbase.org, um, which lets you compare the spectra of different proteins and fluorophores and make sure that um, everything is compatible, there is no crosstalk, there is no bleed through that's going on. Now, these are a lot of words, but if you have any questions on bleed through or crosstalk, do let me know. So in terms of epifluorescence microscope, how does it work? Well, you have a light source which gives you light in visible spectrum, which ranges between 400 nanometers to 700 nanometers. You have um, a filter cube, which consists of the excitation filter, a dichroic mirror, and an emission filter. What the excitation filter does is from this entire visible spectra, picks out the light of your interest, the, the wavelength of your interest. So if we have a fluorophore like FITC or Alexa 488 or green fluorescent protein, we want to excite that using blue light or light with 488 nanometer. So that's what the excitation filter does. The dichroic mirror, as the name suggests, can work with two different wavelengths. It reflects light of shorter wavelength. So it's reflecting the light of shorter wavelength onto the sample. And once the light gets into the sample, the sample emits the fluorescence, which is green in color. It passes through the dichroic mirror, which allows the light of longer wavelength to pass through. It passes through the emission filter into either the eyepiece or it could be our detector, which could be a camera, okay? So that's in principle how an epifluorescence microscope works. 
Now, how does this relate to Kians? So if we look at the cross-section of Kians, and I will be focusing on the fluorescence part of the Kians and not uh, the uh, transmitted light part of the Kians. So if we look at the cross-section of the Kians and just focus on this area, the first thing is we have an excitation source. The excitation source in Kians is a metal halide lamp. This metal halide lamp sits outside the microscope and through a fiber optic cable uh, or the light guide, the light enters through uh, into the microscope. Uh, through a bunch of mirrors, the light gets focused onto the filter cube, which is what I discussed earlier. There's a dichroic mirror over here. The light passes through the objectives and we have got five different objectives on Kians, which I'll talk in a bit. Um, the light goes onto your sample. The light gets reflected back and we have um, a very versatile stage which holds a bunch of different uh, types and slides. Um, and once the light from the sample goes back, it, it goes back to the camera um, for you to visualize your fluorophore or protein of interest, okay? So what I'll do in next uh, few many minutes is break down each of these points, talk a bit more about them, and any of the technical details which are important for you to understand um, in relation to how this will affect your image, okay? So first is the excitation source. Uh, the good thing about the metal halide lamp on Kians is that unlike conventional lamp sources, which only give you wavelengths from 400 nanometer to 700 nanometer, this one extends all the way from 400 to almost 1000 nanometer, which also means that this is amenable to using near infrared range of light to image your fluorophores, okay? So at the moment, the filter sets that we have are DAPI, FITSI, TRITSI, and SCIFI. These are very traditional fluorophores that people use, and there should not be any significant crosstalk when you use this fluorophores, okay? Um, if you plan to use any anything else than that, um, we, we, we will have to talk because we don't have those filter sets. So when it comes to filter set, as I um, discussed with you, it consists of an excitation filter, an emission filter, and you have a dichroic mirror, okay? So your light is passing through the excitation filter. Uh, this is the visible, this is the light in the visible spectrum. Um, once it passes through the excitation filter, you just have the blue light going through. And again, this is representative of a scenario where you have a, a FITSI label. The the dye gets <clears throat> the, the light gets reflected to the dichromatic mirror or the dichroic mirror, hits the sample, and you get the green light, which is passing through the dichroic mirror, through the emission filter, and getting detected. Okay. So with respect to the objectives that we have on the microscope, we have a 4x, 20x, and a 40x air objective, and a 40x and a 60x oil immersion lens. Uh, one thing on the 20x and the 40x air objective is that there are correction colors for this objective. What that means is this objectives can be used with both the glass and the plastic. Um, and when you are here tomorrow, I'll show you how to adjust the correction color. When you are using a cover slip, you have to make sure that the correction color is set to 0.17. And when you are using any kind of a plastic dish, you have to make sure that the correction color on the 20 and the 40X objectives are set to 1.2. And what these numbers mean uh, is that they reflect the thickness of either the cover slip, the glass cover slip in case of 0.17, um, and the thickness of the plastic, which is 1.2 millimeter when you are using any kind of a plastic dish, okay? okay. So this is very important. If you, if you don't change this, um, then you don't get the best quality image that you are um, supposed to get. In case of the objectives, um, 
you don't need to worry too much because you can simply click on the objective that you want and you should be uh, good to go. But some of the numbers that are important um, to understand few essential details of the objectives are of course the magnification that you are using, the numerical aperture of the objective, uh, the whether it's air or oil, um, and the working distance, all right? So the working distance of the objective determines how close you can be to the sample. Um, and the numerical aperture of the objective really helps in um, figuring out what is the resolution that you should be able to get. When we look at the objective, um, it's or the cross section of the objective, it's not just one lens over here and one lens at the back. There are plenty of different lenses within the objective, which makes the objective pretty costly, okay? So use the objectives, don't abuse them. Um, make sure in case you are using any of the oil immersion objective, you wipe the oil um, from the objective using the lens paper, and I'll show you tomorrow um, how to do that. Um, don't bathe uh, the objectives with unnecessary amount of oil, only use sufficient amount of oil, which is a drop itself. Um, and by mistake, the oil ends up getting onto an air objective. Let me know, I'll clean that up, all right? So it's not a big deal. Um, so one question here regarding this working distance. Um, like, is it like I have to do it manually from the software or like how do, like you mentioned here that working distance is 0.21 for this lens, like, how is it like automatic or do I have to manually set it up? Um, so with, with regards to all the air objectives that you have on Kians, it's all automatic. You don't have to do much. When it comes to using oil immersion lens, you have to do things manually. And I'll talk more about that. And tomorrow when you are here, um, I'll demonstrate what that really means. Okay. okay? All right. So... In terms of the resolution, which is this number that you were looking at, what does that mean? So resolution is the ability to differentiate between two distinct objects, okay? Um, and numerical aperture is defined as the refractive index times sine alpha. So let's say if you're using an air objective, the refractive index of air is 1.0 and sine alpha is the angle um, of, the, of the cone of light which is collected uh, by the lens, okay? So for an air objective, this cone of light, the sine alpha, is less compared to a oil immersion objective which has got higher numerical aperture because the oil, um, the oil immersion objective is almost touching the cover slip interface, okay? So that gives you a greater sine alpha. And then if you try to plug in this numbers into the equation for an A, what you end up getting is clearly that um, an objective with a higher NA uh, will give you a better resolution, okay? So if we quickly look through how the numerical aperture affects the resolution, uh, it's nicely shown in this cartoon where the resolution of the image is present, is represented by the point spread function of one bead. So right now we are using a low numerical aperture objective um, and these are a bunch of beads um, that you are kind of looking uh, in your sample. And as we increase the numerical aperture of the objective, now you are able to distinctly see each of these beads. At the same time, the point spread function um, also gets better, right? And as I keep on increasing the numerical aperture, now we are able to distinguish each of these beads um, from one another, which at a low numerical aperture objective, it's not possible, okay? So 
This is exactly what image resolution means, which is your ability to spatially differentiate between two objects, okay? Okay, yeah. So I have like one question regarding from the slide, like, um, because it shows that refractive index. So I think it also in that mounting medium plays a role here, right? For the resolution. That's correct. The mounting medium. Yeah. That's correct. So think in terms of this, which is what is happening when you are imaging. When you are imaging, the light is passing through different media, right? So if the light is passing through air, then it's touching the glass, then it's passing through your mounting media, then it's passing through your cells. Every time light passes through a different media, there is going to be diffraction. And, yeah. and the goal, um, if you want the best possible resolution, is to make sure that your light does not pass through uh, mediums of different refractive indices, okay? Um, and this is much more critical when you are using something like super resolution microscope. Yeah. So, yeah. So when we again kind of look at uh, the array disk patterns, which are resulting from the point spread functions of each of those beads, uh, it's kind of clear that uh, this two beads are unresolved. These are distinct array disk patterns um, that we are able to see. And the resolution is defined as uh, the wavelength divided by two times Na. And the best possible resolution that we can achieve in x, y direction or laterally is 250 nanometers. And of course, this is with a 60x all immersion objective and so on. And the best possible resolution in z direction or axially is 550 nanometers. So if we look at uh, a point spread function of one bead, we can see that this is the kind of a curve we got. Whereas um, with two beads, clearly the point spread function is still looks to you as if it's one bead, but we know that these are two beads instead of one. And when we get enough resolution, we can enough, we can spatially separate two beads, um, we now got two distinct peaks in our point spread function, okay? And in terms of Z, the Z does not look as spherical um, as the X, Y, as it should look in the X, Y direction. Um, and that's just because of optics, okay? So we have a stage on Kians, it's fully motorized, which allows you to do multidimensional X, Y, and Z data acquisition. There is plenty of flexibility on the stage. You can put slides, you can put uh, plastic bottom dishes, as well as any kind of multi-wall plates that you can think of. Um, in terms of um, the stage, as I mentioned, it's pretty versatile. Uh, you can select what kind of a sample you have, would be slide or any kind of a plate. Um, and there are two different slots when it comes to slides. So you can image three slides at the same time. Okay. Uh, Kians also has a navigation tool. The navigation tool really helps you to quickly uh, look at your sample. Let's say you don't know what you're looking at, mainly because you don't have binoculars that you are used to using on a traditional microscope. So you want to understand how your sample looks like. So you can use a low mag objective and quickly scan sort of a seven by seven area to understand uh, how your sample looks like. Um, that also allows you to do kind of tile and stitch using a either a low mag objective or a higher magnification objective. So you have multiple images which can be stitched together on Kians and um, you get one final image as an output, okay? In case of <laughs> the Z, in order to move the stage, um, you can do a few things. Um, so for example, on a traditional microscope, you have got um,
Hey, go up. Hello. Hey, hold on a second. I think we lost. Uh, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm trying to start a few things again. Okay. So, a traditional microscope, we have got the focus knob. Um, on key ends, you know, you don't have focus knobs. So, the way you move in Z direction is by using a bunch of commands over here. So, if you want to move fast, you use shift control and the scroll wheel on the mouse. If you want to go at a medium speed in Z direction, you use control and mouse scroll wheel. If you want to go super fine, um, you can use shift and a scroll wheel. And if you want to uh, go at a normal speed, you can use the mouse scroll wheel. Okay, so these are, these are some of the commands that you need to remember while you're on key ends to make your life a bit easy when you are going to the sample. And I'll have them um, stuck somewhere around the microscope as a cheat sheet, so it's easy for you to always refer back to them. Um, in case of camera, the camera that you need to um, worry about is just the monochrome camera, and I'll talk more about uh, the gain and so on, which can play an important part in how the image um, looks like. So. Uh, the image dimensions that you can get using the camera is 1920 by 1440. That's the high resolution standard image that you should always acquire. Now, there are situations in which you will be acquiring images which might be at a standard resolution. And what that means is the image dimensions are changed now. It will be a smaller image, 960 by 720 in pixels which also means that this is going to be pinned. Now, we also have an option to acquire the image at 1920 by 1440, and you can save it um, at a lower aspect ratio, okay? So I'll talk a bit more about this. You can also acquire the image at 1920 by 1440 at high resolution, and the software allows you an ability to save it at 4080 by 3060, which they call high resolution zoom. Now what's happening over here is uh, you are extrapolating the pixels from whatever you have here and making sure that those pixels, making sure that the image just looks more smoothened out. So you are not actually gaining any more data, but it's just going to be a giant image with smoothened out pixels, okay? So I would, I would just recommend acquiring everything at 1920 by 1440, which is high resolution standard, um, if your sample permits. If your sample does not permit that, then you can try binning, playing with gain and so on, which I'll talk in a bit over here now. So when it comes to images, images are nothing else but bunch of pixels, okay? And each of these pixels has a value. Each of this pixel has a value. So this values of a pixel, it depends on the bit depth of the camera. So what does the bit depth mean? So typically on a camera, when you're acquiring the image, specifically for key ends, uh, the bit depth on key ends is 16 bit, okay? So each bit refers to two shades of grays. So if I'm acquiring, let's say, a three-bit image that's two to the power of three, which is two to the four to the eight. So the dynamic range you get is eight for a three-bit image, which means there are eight shades of grays, okay? So let's say if there is a three-bit image with eight shades of grays, your eyes can easily differentiate those eight shades of grays. So if you try to go further ahead, your eyes can, in fact, easily differentiate up to five-bit image, which has 32 shades of grays, right? So these are, these are about 32 shades of grays, which your eyes can still differentiate. But as we go higher into bit depth, let's say eight-bit, which is 256 shades of grays, or 16-bit, which are now 65,000 
shades of grays, our eyes cannot differentiate that. And hence, um, when we go back to an image over here, we can figure out what shade of gray that is based on these numbers, okay? So a 16-bit image has a dynamic range from zero up to 65,000. And, and that's what the key ends gives to you, okay? Now, the other thing is when I showed to you that you can start with the high resolution of 1920 by 1440, which means you have 1920 pixels in X direction and 1440 pixels in Y direction. So if we look at a normal image, we will have, let's say 1920 by 1440 pixels, assuming that, uh, we can bin the image. And what does binning the image means? It means that we will consider this four pixels to be one. So if we are binning this image two by two, we are now um, combining all the data that we are getting from this four pixels as one. And what that also does is, if you have, it, it's going to add up the intensity values uh, that are spread across this four pixels. At the same time, the image will also start to look very pixelated, right? Because now we are getting fewer pixels as we continue to bin. Okay. So I have so, a question. If we do yeah, binning, um, sorry, if we do binning, can we then adjust the resolution because it gets pixelated? No. So let me show the data. You cannot adjust the resolution. Okay. Once it's it's been. Uh, the image gets pixelated. So for example, if we look at the mitochondria, which is acquired at normal, uh, standard, and a one lower than that, here we can see the structural details of the mitochondria. Whereas as we start to bin, that is getting lost. Okay? Yeah. However, we are also, what is happening is we are also gaining uh, information in terms of intensity. So the, the trickiness over here is, it depends on the question you are asking. Let's say if, if all that you want to look at is a uh, cytoplasmic protein, right? Or if you want to look at nucleus, uh, the fluorescence coming from the nucleus, then you don't need to image uh, with high resolution because nucleus is going to be nucleus even if it's binned or not. There is no more structural information that you are getting out of nucleus unless you want to visualize proteins within the nucleus, right? If you are imaging cells and you want to get information of cytoplasm, then it doesn't matter if I acquire image through high resolution or standard resolution because cytoplasmic fluorescence will be cytoplasmic fluorescence. But the key over here is once you start acquiring your data with one image setting, stick to it, okay? You cannot change between a bin image and then go back and image with high resolution because that will now change uh, the pixel intensity values and you will not be able to compare between images, all right? So, some of the important things with imaging parameters is also uh, to understand two other things, which is the imaging parameters are a combination of fluorescence light, which is hitting the sample, and the camera exposure. And all of this um, relates to whether or not your sample will photo bleach fast again or not. So I'll, I'll talk a bit more about the fluorescence light and the exposure as we discuss the user interface of Kians. Uh, but as long as you are using uh, a mounting media which has got anti-fade, for example, you know, prolonged gold, uh, which has got anti-fade in it, the bleaching should not be terrible. Now, let's say an example, 
if you are getting your live cells onto the microscope and the live cells does not, it, the live cells only have your regular media. It does not have any kind of anti-fade in it. So in that situation, let's say if you have your um, fluorophore, which is FITSI in your live cells, FITSI will start to bleach really very fast. You can literally see green fluorescence going from yeah here all the way at the top to all the way at the bottom really very fast. And that's where you want to make sure that you are controlling the amount of fluorescence light, which is hitting the sample, um, and you can potentially increase the exposure. So if your sample is sensitive to photo bleaching, you want to reduce the light coming onto the sample and you want to increase your exposure time of the camera, okay? All right, so some of the housekeeping things on this computer. The first thing is you use your Emory ID to log into the computer. Once you log into the computer using your Emory ID, you will need the same ID to log into the PPMS system. Once you are logged in, click onto the key and software and you're good to go. It's, it's just that simple. Except for the first time when you are here, I will configure um, the system so that you don't need to do anything else, which is something I'll do tomorrow when you are here. A uh, few other things, we have got four filter sets. Um, as I talked to you earlier, um, if you want to use transmitted light imaging, you will only remove the uh, fourth filter set, which is the sci-fi or 647. Um, and again, when you are removing the filter set, wear gloves, do not touch the mirror surface on the filter set. Uh, once you touch that, it's extremely difficult to clean. Uh, that will affect the light intensity and, and screw up a lot of things for everybody. Um, put the filter set right away in one of the plastic bags and secure this plastic bag into the plastic box. So I'll, I'll also show this part to you tomorrow in case if you need to remove the filter set, I'll remove that. Putting the filter set back inside could be a bit tricky. So I don't expect you to put the filter set back in. Um, you can mention that on the whiteboard, which will be on the wall next to the microscope, whether or not uh, the, 640, the, the 647 filter set is inside or outside. And I'll, I can take care of putting the filter set back in um, if anybody else needs to use that. Okay. Um, and once um, you remove the filter set, and if you want to change the name of the channel that you have, once you start the system, you can click on this filter cube, which will bring up this window. And in that window, you can go and click on channel four and change the information over here, whether or not this is a fluorescence image or a transmitted light image and write the appropriate name for the filter set, either 647 or transmitted light. Okay, it's totally up to you what you want to write. And when you are logging out of the system, do not please log out using PPMS because if you log out using PPMS, somebody else will not be able to log in with their credentials. So just log out using the Windows menu. Um, and to do that, click on the Windows button, uh, go on to your name, and then just sign out. Okay? That's simple. All right. So in terms of opening the software, this is how your desktop should look like. Once I configure everything, when you are here, click on the BZX 800 viewer software. Um, I'll talk more about Analyzer when you are here, but the focus of this talk is about acquisition and not the analysis. So once you click on BZX 800 viewer, this window will pop up, just click log in and it should ask you what kind of a sample do you have? Um, and that depends so that you can adjust a part so that you can use a proper kind of a sample holder, which could be, you know, slide your plate or so on. Um, if you miss that over here, you still get one more chance later on once the software starts to select the right kind of a plate or a sample holder. Click on the capture still images right over here and that brings up 
this user interface, all right? Now, this user interface looks very busy, but it's fantastically modular. And I'll break this up into 10 different uh, regions for you. So the first is the stage view, and this is typically how I would set up my imaging parameters if I have to emit something. So first thing is the stage view where I select what kind of a sample holder I have. Um, second is click on the regions anywhere so that I get my sample uh, kind of in focus in X, Y direction, right? Because depending, let's say if I'm using slide and my sample is right here somewhere, I can go and click on that and uh, the objective is sort of in the right orientation to where the sample is. So use this area, click anywhere. It works fantastic. You can also move your sample once you are close to it by clicking this arrow buttons um, or simply by dragging on the screen, okay? So third is, is uh, if you are imaging for fluorescence, click on the monochrome camera. Once you have clicked on the monochrome camera, the next goal is to set up the imaging parameters. And I would do that uh, looking at every single channel that you have a fluorophore for. So I, I will go on the single color and click on DAPI, FITSI, TRITSI, or so on, whatever you have as your fluorophore. Adjust the right kind of an objective either 4x, 20x, 40x, or so on. Uh, go to your illumination setting. This is where I was talking earlier, which is adjusting an image, adjusting imaging parameters is a fun interplay between how much light is coming onto the sample and your exposure. So we will be setting the illumination, which is either you want 100% of the light to go onto your sample, or you can also change this to 70% or 30%. And what that does is it introduces a barrier uh, or neutral density filter to cut the amount of light which passes through, okay? And we'll talk more about that. And then is the exposure, which is for how long you want the shutter of your camera to stay open. Uh, use the autofocus, which is really fantastic on this microscope. Use the autofocus uh, button. And the last thing is navigation uh, toolbar over here, which is if you want to look at how your sample distribution is on a larger scale, click on navigation, and we can quickly see a ton of cells or figure out the boundary of the tissue and so on, okay? And from there on, I'll talk about the capture area settings. So uh, if you think about this software in this modular fashion, it will not be intimidating for you. And it will also help you understand what is it that you are exactly doing while you are on the instrument versus just clicking random buttons. Okay, So let's go through each of them. So the first and the second, Sample holder, it's really straightforward. As I mentioned, you can select whatever slides you want to, go and click on different areas and get done with that. However, you also have the option of storing different areas. So let's say you just want to compare three different slides that you have. And you, know, you go and set things over here, you go back over here, and you don't remember where to go back now. So you can um, set up the point memo for different regions. So for example, if this is where my first uh, cover slip was, I can just go and click over here, which is where my first cover slip was, which is where my first sample of interest is, go on to the second slide, and again, go and set for the second point, go somewhere else, go and set for the third point. So in that way, you can easily go between slides and uh, between samples, okay? Um, go, and that's pretty much it. Uh, when it comes to camera setting, this is where things get a bit tricky, okay? 
So you go onto the monochromatic camera and the camera setting window looks very harmless to you, right? But there is so much hidden in it. So let's break that out. So first thing is the exposure on camera, which as I said, we can adjust later also. So you can adjust exposure right right now, or we can adjust at later point. If you pull down on this menu, which is called high resolution, this is where things get tricky, all right? So by default, uh, it will give you an option of using high resolution, standard, or high sensitivity. Um, and you can pick each of them, or you can click on custom and do a bunch of things. So I'll talk a bit more about what this means. And once we click on custom, it opens up this menu for you. And even in this menu, we can adjust the brightness and exposure, but this menu gives you two more options. One, which is gain. So you have different options of gain all the way from zero decibel to 24 decibel. And I'll show you what this means. And binning, which is going from two byte to three by three to four by four and so on. Okay, so let's break each of this into individual segments and understand what's happening in relationship to the image. So for example, as I mentioned earlier, this instrument allows you to capture at high resolution, which is 1920 by 1440. Now, if you pick standard, automatically what it does is it does a two by two binning, okay? Not to confuse the standard in the resolution with standard in the binning, okay? These are two different things. So if you pick standard resolution by default, it's going to bin your image by two and the resolution now is 1960 by 720. If you use high sensitivity, by default, it's going to bin the image by three and your aspect ratio is going to be 640 by 480. You can go into custom and do a binning of four by four also if you wish to, all right? So uh, that's pretty much the resolution sensitivity. Now, in terms of camera setting and binning, something I already showed to you, this is how the effect of binning is going to look like. And when you uh, go for saving your image, it will tell you the image size, which is, uh, if I'm using high resolution, the image size is 1920 by 1440. If I'm using standard, the image size is 960 by 720. And if I'm using high sensitivity, the image size is 640 by 480. So the only place the software tells you about the image size is when you are trying to go and save the images or else this information will not appear, okay? So one question uh, on that, um, can we change the image size here? It looks like there's an arrow button. Yes, so once we acquire the image at 1920 by 1440, we can change the image size to anything we want to. Once you acquire image at 9, 9, 960 by 720, you can only save the images at sizes lower than this, but not any higher than this, okay? Okay. Uh, and when we look at the image histogram for each of these binned images, this is what we get out of it, right? So at high resolution where the structure uh, is pretty perfect, and I want to, again, highlight one thing is, what you are seeing over here is the exposure was not changed at all for all the images, right? Yeah. So when you keep the exposure constant um, and you bin the images, the pixel intensity value changes, which can be demonstrated or observed in this histogram. So uh, the min, the minima and the maxima are zero to 20,000 uh, shades of grays, whereas when you look uh, at the bend image, the, minim the maxima and the minima are changing now, right? So you are introducing more noise in your sample at the same time. 
Okay, does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Uh, give me a second. I need to put my phone for charging. I'm losing battery really quick. Okay. Do you hear me well now? Yeah, I do hear. Okay. Um, cool. So, one question like regarding this histogram at the bottom, like when it says like beginning 256 number, like what does it mean? Because we are, I was thinking like it's a, it should be like a ratio two by two or three by three, something like that, right? Um, I mean, like what it exactly meaning that 256? So, um, with with that, this is this is the histogram that. Um, I obtained using Fiji. This is not uh, part of the histogram which you see on the software itself. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll talk about that in a bit. But uh, to, to answer a question exactly, what does uh, BINS 256 mean? I do not know. I'll have to get back to you on that. Okay. But could you explain one more time? I think you already explained that mini, that minima and maxima. Um, just to refresh myself. Okay. Sure. So um, think about uh, this to be the entire dynamic range of your sample, right? Mm -hmm. So um, this is a 16-bit image, which means that the dynamic range will be all the way from zero to 65,500. Now, uh, the histogram is showing you the distribution of your pixels. So how many pixels have an intensity of, let's say if this is about 10,000, right? So this many pixels have the intensity of 10,000. This many pixels have the intensity of about uh, 100 and so on, uh, but the maximum Pixel, the maximum num the maximum pixel intensity that we are seeing with a high resolution um, image is of twenty thousand and and not more than that. Okay. So so this is simply a distribution of the intensity for each of the pixel. Okay. okay? So mm -hmm. and again with the same thing uh, with with this image uh, which was acquired in a standard mode, you can see the histogram shifting towards right, which is now we are getting more and more of uh, pixels which are in the range of 65,000. Although you don't see them over here, but that's what the math tells you, right? Mm -hmm. um, and if you take a mean of all the pixels that you are seeing over here, the, the mean intensity value of all the pixels now is um, 8,193 versus in the high resolution, uh, the mean pixel intensity of all the pixels is 2,000. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and in terms of gain, right? So if you change the gain on the camera, what is it doing for you? It's again, shifting the histogram towards right, right? So it's taking everything which is right here, amplifying the signal and shifting towards the right. So if you compare values from zero decibel to 24 decibel, uh, you, are, you are not getting pixelated, right? There is no pixelation going. It's not like binning, but you are shifting 
your histogram from left to the right. And that's what you can see from this trans over here. Make sense? Yeah. So the, the point is, depending on your sample, uh, if your sample is pretty dim, um, you can play with the gain, you can play with binning and so on to get the best image, okay? So gaining also, is it like something correlated with exposure time? No, so gain no. has nothing to do with the exposure time. So let's kind of go back over here. So if we, if we go to this, this is the only thing that you will see. Actually, mm. it's better if I go all the way over here, okay? So if you go back to the first one, this is what you see. And, and typically what anybody would do is you would just go and click on high resolution, click on brightness exposure. This is where you set your exposure of the camera and you decide how much light I want to get through, okay? And if your sample is looking great, you know, by all means go for it. But let's say if you are doing Z stacking over here and you know that you will be continuously exposing your sample and that might photo bleach your sample, then you can go into more of these options that I talked about, right? And you can, you can use some of these options. I mean, it, it's also possible that to begin with, um, your sample might be very dim, right? And, and the exposure time that you have to use could be, let's say, one or two seconds. And if you let the light get into your sample for one or two seconds, the chances that you might bleach your sample are pretty high. So in that situation, to decrease the exposure time, you might take advantage of the gain feature on the camera, okay? So when you increase the gain, of course, it also increases the background. But at the same time, you can play with brightness contrast setting um, to remove any of the background increase that you are getting. Make sense? Yeah. So uh, in terms of the image histogram, everything I showed you over here is kind of a snapshot from Fiji. The system, Kians also has its own histogram which can be accessed under image. However, the problem with Kians' histogram is that the values range from zero to 255. Now, this gives you a false impression that the image you are acquiring is an eight-bit image where in fact, the image you are acquiring is translated to a 16-bit image. So, you know, by all means, you can go and use the image histogram on Kians, but use it only to adjust brightness contrast and nothing else. And when you are adjusting brightness and contrast, um, your image is going to look different, but that is not going to change the overall pixel values okay so just keep in mind that if you play with this slider bars back and forth that won't change the actual pixel values um, one last thing i also want to talk about this software is under measure you also have the option uh, to check on the highlight saturated pixel this is similar to high low uh, lookup table on uh, many of the confocal microscopes. What this tells you is whether or not your pixels are now saturated, okay? What saturation means is something like this, right? The, the dynamic range that our image has is, has is from zero to 65,000. If you are pixel intensity values go any higher than 65,000, they cannot be displayed. So that means your image is saturated and you want to play with your intensity and your exposure and your gain perhaps in such a way that um, the intensity fits between zero to 65,000, okay? Mm. All right, and then um, if you want to acquire single color and channel, so 
let's say you click on single color, you click on one of the channels that you want to acquire, and you got a you got an image right away. Now, the other thing which is also possible, I mean, typically people are so used to seeing, oh, I want to see things in color, I want to see things in color, right? Which is great. Uh, typically, most of the microscopes overlay a lookup table on their monochrome images. But what Kians does is something very weird, wherein uh, they save the image in a different kind of a format such that when you open the image, it is displayed as an RGB image with three different channels or colors, which is red, green, and blue. So uh, that kind of becomes a bit of a problem. Um, and if you look at the size of the image, you will see that this is about uh, 5.3 MB. And this, because it has got three channels within it, it is 16 MB, right? So sure, I mean, if it's a blue color, it's okay. You got red, green, and blue. You can ignore the red and green images and just work with the blue image, okay? You can extract that. But things get a bit more complicated as we use other colors, for example, the aqua or magenta or yellow, because those three colors are combinations of red, green, and blue. And at that point, you cannot extract your, your image. So if you want to do any kind of a quantification on your data, you definitely want to acquire monochrome images and not color images, okay? So I would say if you want to visualize or see really quick on screen um, how the merge of different colors look like, by all means, go and use uh, the colors over here. But when it comes to acquisition, I would strongly avoid acquiring the images in color and I would only acquire images uh, in monochromes, okay? So then comes to the fun part, the objective. We have uh, different objectives, uh, 4X, 20X, 40X, which are all air objectives, and 40 and 60 oil. So if you click on this lens button, it brings up this menu for you. And if you click on adjust lens, what it will do is uh, it will change the objective and bring that in front of you. And this is important when you want to put a drop of oil onto the objective, okay? So if you want to use a 40X or a 60X oil objective, you click on adjust lens, click on one of these objectives. The system will bring that objective in front of you. You can put a drop of oil and get done with it. The system again reminds you to make sure that your correction color is perfectly set. Um, for glass, it's 0 .7, 0 0.17, and for plastic, it's 1.2. Um, the thing with the oil immersion lens is that it does not come to the right focus. Uh, and in order to set the focus for the oil immersion lens, you have to uncheck on prevent lens crash, which can be accessed from the option menu. Okay, so you click on menu option that takes you to prevent lens crash. And it tells you you're about to disable lens crash. Are you sure you want to do that? And you can say yes. And you have to be very careful over here because um, when you put a drop of oil, your objective is almost touching the cover slip interface. And at that point, you want to slowly and gradually go towards the sample and not overdo it or else that would be a bit of stress on the objective, okay? So we will, we will look at this tomorrow uh, in action. In terms of illumination settings, um, we have four different illumination settings, 100% um, and again, once I turn on the software, we can look at more of them. Um, there are neutral density filters, which uh, prevent the, or which blocks the access of light to pass through. And that also helps in uh, preventing photo bleaching. In terms of camera exposure, again, um, you can play with 
uh, the slider to change the exposure values in milliseconds on your system. So that's the slider you will be using. When you bring your sample, again, the autofocus is a very helpful button. You just click on autofocus and it focuses your sample really perfect for you. And last is the navigation, which allows you to quickly view a larger area. So this is the entire area that uh, we have imaged and the pink is the area which shows you the current field of view, okay? So you can do this for as many samples you want to by going to navigation and just click add and it will image a seven by seven area for you. Um, few other options which are really helpful uh, right in the capture area settings are multi-point capture. So for example, you image this entire area and you want to acquire different regions within this. So how do you acquire that? So you acquire different regions within it by saving uh, different regions using multi-point feature. So you go to the first area, say set, or to the second area of your interest, say set, or to the third area of your interest and say set. And once you are good with that, you will go and click start capture, okay? You will not click capture because if you click capture, it's only going to image just one area and not all of them. So if you want to image everything that you have um, saved over here, you want to click on start capture, okay? And same thing with stitching, let's say I image this entire thing on my, um, navigation uh, tool, and I want to only acquire this much using a hard magnification objective. There are two different ways of doing it. One is by setting the edge points, wherein I can go to the edge of my tissue um, and set them up, <laughs> and then just click Start Capture. Or I can use a set center and number of images. So I can just come to the center over here and say I want to acquire six by three or seven by eight or 11 by 11 or even two by two and uh, go and hit start capture, okay? And that's going to capture everything. Uh, I will demonstrate once everything is captured, how to open in the analysis window and stitch images together um, when we when I do the demo. And the last thing is the Z stack, pretty straightforward. You can set the upper limit, lower limit. Pitch is the uh, distance you want to acquire each Z position at. So if you want to leave positions of one or two or three microns between each Z image, um, you can enter that over here and start capture, right? So this software also has a feature of removing the background fluorescence, either by using 1D slit or 2D pinhole. However, this methods acquire multiple images and hence that will slow down the total acquisition time. So for example, when you use uh, 1D slit you can see that a lot of the background which is present in the cell is just gone, right? And same thing with um, 2D pinhole. <laughs> Again, a lot of this background um, has gone after using the 2D pinhole. So the last thing, saving your data. Once you um, want to save your data when you are acquiring your images, The system will tell you where you want to save the data. Everything we do gets saved under uh, the A drive, under user data, the year that we are in, um, and your lab, and however you want to image, or how, however you want to save that, okay? So uh, two different things. If you want to acquire multi-color channels, you have to turn 
them on over here manually. So you go to the multicolor option and turn on different channels and hit capture. If you are only acquiring single color um, and you hit capture, you will only acquire one of the images. Um, and when you are using the system and you get through some kind of an issue, um, I'm available to help you remotely using BombGuard. Just let me know and I'll, I can remotely log into the system and I can help you at any time, okay? So that's that. There is one more thing which I was missing in telling you. Um, and let me go back really quick to this one. Okay, so when you are on the uh, screen over here, if anything is turned solid blue, that means you have enabled it, okay? So every time you see something solid blue, it means that is active. So that's a, that's a nice feature about the software where, where it highlights everything with the solid blue color, okay? So right now, there is this blue line under single color, which means I'm acquiring things using single color. Um, I'm using a monochromatic camera. I'm using DAPI. Um, I have stitching turned on and so on. All right. So that's all I wanted to tell you in terms of the software. So let me uh, put my sample on um, and I can, and then we can, go into the demo part of it okay so give me a second all right so with regards to the sample what you will see is this desktop right here i will go ahead and click on bzx 800 viewer it will bring up this login screen i'll say okay uh, this is what i was telling you that if you want to change the filter cube you click over there and you can adjust uh, the name which is its bright fill or fluorescence or so on if you want to assign a color to your channel you can do that over here too but i would not really mess up with this um, except for this, for the fourth channel, um, where you might want to change the filter cube um, and, and use transmitted light image. Okay. Um, directly, you can go to the capture still images. It's going to load things. It will ask me whether I have a slide, a plate, or so on. I have a slide right now, so I'll say okay. It will quickly bring up this menu for me, all right? I know my slide is over here, so let me first go and delete what I have. So if I uncheck this blue, it will ask me, it wants to delete everything. I'll say, okay, that's fine. So now this means I'm no longer using the stitching parameter, right? Um, so as, as I said earlier, let's say, I'll go and delete all these points that I had acquired yesterday. I'll say, yes, I don't want to look at any of them. I know my sample is right here. So this was the second step we talked about, which is looking onto the sample. So I'm, I'm manually looking at my sample. And making sure that my objective is where the cover slip and hence the sample is right now it's in position so in case if i miss that in future i'll just go and click set right here so i can always come back at this point in case if i click something else randomly i'm dropping my condenser down so that um, i can get the light in focus so as i said um, i'll go to single color and adjust each of the channels individually. Um, I'm happy with the objective I have, which is the 20X objective. So I'll keep it the way it is. Um, 
I'll have 100% of the light passing through and getting to my sample. Um, we can use neutral density filter and cut down the light to either 40%, 20, 10, um, and so on as we go to the bottom, right? So the option between 40 and 100% is not much. So either you take 40 or you take 100%. So I'll, I'll take 100% of the light coming through at the moment. Um, I'll set my exposure to some random amount right now, which is okay. And I'll click on autofocus. It will ask me, do I want to turn the low photo bleach option off? What that means is that the light is going to pass through. I'll say yes. Um, once it's in focus, it will ask me whether I want to turn the low photo bleach option on again. And I'll say yes, so that it stops the light passing through, okay? So again, if, if this is unchecked, the light continuously passes through the sample and your sample gets bleached. The other way of focusing your region is by just moving the image left to right, top through bottom. You can toggle your image that way. Uh, and then the last thing, number 10, is turning on the navigation. I'll create a new navigation pan over here uh, and say add and it's going to go and scan the image in a serpentine pattern, it will give you a seven by seven uh, tiled area for you to select your cells from. Again, this is DAPI, it's not that exciting. Uh, so let's kind of close this. And, and one of the good thing about Keyans is, even if you close anything, you can always go back and it's right there for you. It doesn't remove anything. It, it stores that last part in its memory. So let's say I wanna look at 488 now and see how that looks like. So uh, this is how the image is looking like. Uh, I can increase my exposure. I can try to see if I can adjust uh, the image settings a bit better and they look a okay and i'll again go and in the navigation say add it's going to create a new navigation pan and will give me the data okay so this is kind of a much more nicer area which helps me look at the cells that i have and i can pick a bunch of cells that i want to image Later on, let's say using a 40x objective, so I can quickly go to a 40x objective and say that now I would like to image, let's say this cell that I was I was seeing uh, under low mag. Okay, so I'm right here where the cell is. Can close this, and let's say if I'm happy with what I'm looking at. Uh, I can set my parameters for Tritzy, uh, which is my mitochondria channel. Uh, let's say increase the exposure, okay? And if I'm happy with uh, how these three channels look like, I can go and turn on the multicolor turn on the other two channels. And if you just want to see how they look like, let's say I can assign them colors at the moment. And say recapture all. So I'm not saving anything right now. This is just for me to see how different channels look like in respect to one another, okay? And then if you want to capture all of them. All right, so I'll demonstrate how that is going to look like. So again, go to the data drive A, user data, 2020. I'm in my folder right now. I'll make a new folder with today's date. And uh, 
what it will do, because we have multiple images, it's going to ask you to create a group folder, okay? So I'll just call it image one. And it tells me it's gonna acquire four images. In reality, it's only acquiring three images. The fourth image it gives you is just a merge of all three images. And I'll say yes. And it will open up the viewer by default and you can see individual images and the merge image. Okay, so one, two, three, and the fourth image. Now we can also see this images um, in the data drive A folder, user data 2021. I'll go to my folder. And we have this four images, okay? And this is what I was talking about earlier. So actually, let's let's compare what happens if you acquire with grayscale and and without and with color. So we, right now we acquired everything with color. So let's acquire this in grayscale now. All right. So I'm going to turn off. So now at point you you feel like you are stuck. Nothing is happening. It's all grayed out. Click on this live image and everything will again um, be functional. I'll go to default for each of them and I'll capture and make a second folder, which is image two. Okay, so just the same thing gives me blue, green, uh, mitochondria, and a merge of all the monochrome images, which is pretty useless. So I'll open image two here. And if we go to image one and open that in Fiji. So let's say if I open my mitochondria channel in Fiji, okay? Uh, compare the monochrome and compare the color image. So clearly you see that the monochrome is 5.3 MB in size. And if we look at the channel, if we look at channels, there is only one channel over here. Whereas if we look at the color image, um, it's 16 MB in size. And if we look at the channels, because it's magenta, it has got mixture of red and blue, right? So this is the problem I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. You cannot quantify a RGB image, whereas you can quantify a monochrome image, okay? And hence my push to acquire data in monochrome and if you want to add color, we can always add color using Fiji, whatever color you want, right? So for example, I can add magenta and, and typically most of the microscopes and the softwares, they would let you overlay a color without converting it to RGB image, which Kians for some reason, that's how they want to push things. So if you, if you change it, if you keep it the same color for these two pictures, will it like the, I think the con, it would like look similar, right? In that scenario, it would, will not see any difference. It just the, um, I mean, like J, like you mentioned, that image has that option. Uh, it's not RGB, right? Um, but so you but, you can you can change this to RGB if you want to. So let's say if I want to save, uh, I can uh, convert this to an RGB color image, and now it's an RGB. Okay. Okay. But, but uh, I want to close this and again open it. So, but typically, no matter what imaging software that at least I have used, I have always found an option to overlay a color without without the image becoming an RGB image. Okay, so mm -hmm. I can make this sun or whatever. 
in this situation, you cannot add a lookup table just like, let's say, if I make this sign, uh, then if I, let's say, make a composite out of that, the color changes, right? So I cannot go and change the image. And then if I want to, let's say, get some pixel intensity value, so let's do this. Let's make this color again and compare. And this was initially red in color, so I'll keep it red. And I've not done this before, but this is also going to be an experiment for me. So I'm gonna save this region um, and let's do measure, okay? So if I measure this, the mean in this area is 4631. And if I measure the same area in this image, <laughs> the mean again changes a little bit, right? Because yeah. now we are having um, different distribution of pixel intensities mm -hmm. uh, between just one channel versus something is spread between two channels over here. So that's the kind of difference I'm talking here. And, and when you want to do data quantification, you want to have a monochrome image. All right? Yeah. So when you save that monochrome image, how do you know that which one is here, the mitochondria, which one is um, the cytoplasmic? Just, just looking at the picture, like the monochrome. So, so, I mean, if you read the images, right, it says image channel one, channel two, channel three. Yeah. Um, and I know that my first channel is my DAPI, my second channel yeah. is my mm -hmm. actin, my third channel is mitochondria. So by default, it ends up storing images as channel one, two, and three. Yeah. Okay. And if I was to acquire four channels, there will be one more channel to over okay. there. All right. So going back to live image, um, and this is something uh, that I did not talk uh, a lot because I covered this. Again, you can go to custom. Um, we can change the binning, right? So that, that gets higher. Keep the binning off. Uh, I can increase the gain and so on, right? So that's something which I described uh, in the presentation. Uh, it's easy to compare different images to get an idea of what's changing versus if I keep on clicking things, it's very difficult to register those kind of things. So <laughs> the last thing I'll show you is the sectioning with 3D slit. I guess this is a good cell to look at. So just one so, question, big question. Yeah. Um, for the same cover slip, say for example, like we are now looking at on the same cover, like under the same cover slip, right? Um, and we are looking for different location of the sample. Um, I think it's, it's recommended or can I do, say for one area, I do see there's like dim and one area is bright on the same, under the same cover slip. Can I use different resolution for that part? or I should be, should be constant for under all, for all the area I'm exposing. Under you, you, should, you should be constant for all the areas that you're exposing. Okay. You, should not, you should not change because if you change. Hello. Hey. Hello. Change. Hello. So what I was talking about um, different samples and, and different 
emerging parameters is since your goal is to compare the fluorescence intensity following transfection between samples, mm -hmm. I would not recommend changing the intensity at all uh, or changing the imaging parameters at all. The only time you want to change the imaging parameters is let's say you acquire everything and then you want to show some of your cells um, at a higher resolution, right? Um, mm -hmm. at, at that point, I would say, okay, um, change the imaging parameters here or there to make your cell look nicer just for a pictorial purpose. But when it comes to analysis purpose, I would say don't do that. So let's say, for example, um, you don't need to acquire everything using a 40x objective. If 20x objective is good enough for you to look at the nucleus, is good enough for you to look at the cytoplasm, you know, then by all means use 20x. Uh, but if you think that you want to use a 40x objective to uh, zoom into a cell and get a nicer picture to put into your presentation, then use a 40x objective later on. But for all the quantification that we want to do, I would say stick to one objective, stick to one imaging parameter, and, and your choice of the imaging parameter will depend um, on you looking at your different samples at the same time. So for example, uh, you want to look at your positive control and see what is the maximum intensity you get out of it, right? And, yeah. and, base, and, and set your imaging parameters based on what is the max intensity you need. Then you go back to your negative control and see whether whatever dynamic range that we are getting is that good enough to get the low values um, in your sample. So it's going to be kind of a fine interplay between getting your lows and getting your highs and, and settling for that parameter. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, okay. sure. All right, so what I wanted to show you uh, was the sectioning and the 1D and 2D slit. So I was um, at 40X before, and then I switched to 20X. So at 40X, right, uh, if I, let's say, go and turn on my sectioning, which is now I see with this blue. Um, and I just do preview. So you can you can see a bit of the change. There is a bit of haze. And, and this is much more clear when I use a 20X objective versus a 40X objective. So now if I turn my sectioning on and click on preview, that's the image I'll get. Now this image is much more sharper compared to turning it off, right? Yeah. So that's the difference we are talking. Uh, going to multipoint, uh, which is something of your interest so again, it will go back to 20X objective. Uh, it's asking me, would I like to capture the points or in the point memoirs capture points? No, I don't, I want to set up a new multipoint. So let's say I want to capture an area over here. And I say, set that as a capture point. I want to set this area, set that. I want to keep this area, set this as a capture point and say, I'll, you know what I'll do is I'll, I'll go back to my multicolor and turn on these channels, right? And what it's gonna do now, if I hit capture, it will only capture one area, right? But I don't wanna capture just one area. I wanna capture all of them. So I will uh, hit start capture and it's asking me what can name the group folder. So I'll call it multipoint. And say okay. Say yes. 
And the way the images get stored, so it's going to different areas right now. And if I open my folder, um, it's in multipoint and it's saving each image as X, Y, one, two, and three, okay? Or each set of images, I should say, as X, Y, one, two, and three. Uh, same thing with your, let's say, we want to acquire, uh, and I'm going to go back to live image uncheck on multi-point, which means I'll be losing all my data points. And I want to stitch something, right? So let's say I go and uh, say I want to set the center and do a three by three to look at the number of, to look at the maximum number of cells I can possibly have. I'll say, okay and um, hit start capture. And I'll call this stitching and say, okay. Uh, so as you can see over here, the, the space starts to fill very fast, right? It's 413 MB with high resolution. Uh, what I can do is if I use standard mode uh, and I say, say, okay, the file size is four times lesser okay so it's up to you how you how you want to handle images and so on um, i'll stick to the standard mode for the moment so that the acquisition happens pretty fast i mean it, it won't really make much of a difference the acquisition is more so dependent on the exposure parameter and considering we are switching between the turrets it's going to take the time it's going to take uh, the only time it will save is when we are stitching the images together. That's when we will see a difference. Okay, so we are stitching this right now. And real quick. So one one question here. Um, so in the stitching part, basically we are stitching all the images in that square, right? In the green, in the green area, yes. Right. And when we had this uh, previously, when we had this multi-point images, can we stitch on those multi-point images together? No, we cannot stitch multi. Multi points are individual points right. here and there, right? So yeah. if you want to stitch, you go to the stitching part. So mm -hmm. once the images are acquired, I'll say analyze images, and it will open up this viewer. I'll say stitch, uh, load. and say start stitching, uncompress, start stitching. And we get all our images together, okay? The only thing is uh, we will have to save them individually, which is you go file, export in original scale, save as, and uh, right, so just, call this uh, mito and close. I'll call this actin and close. I'll call this uh, Dappy and I'll close my image. Okay. And we can um, open all our images in Fiji. Or we can also load them in the viewer software. That's also possible. Okay. Going to, let's say, Merge the channels. So copy, actin, 
and Mito. Right, and you get your merge images. So in this way, you know, you can have thousands of cells that are that are at your disposable con for quantification. And this is exactly something that you want for your data set, right? Right. And I think you already discussed uh, that if I want to increase the brightness, I can do that, right? Like from here, like it looks like um, not that much bright. Okay, so on the computer. No, this, this, this is a great point to, to make. So this, I, I kind of highlighted saying you can adjust brightness contrast. So right, this is what you can do. But let's, let's look at one thing. When we are doing this, the point I want to pass to you is that brightness contrast is not going to change. So in real time, we are looking at the pixel values of the line that I've drawn. And when I'm changing my brightness contrast, right? Mm -hmm. It's not changing my pixel intensity values. Okay, they are, hold on, let me do live. Okay, so now we are looking at live. So if I move my line, uh, the pixel values change, right? Uh, but if I change the brightness contrast, that's not changing any of these values. So uh, changing this minima and maxima only helps you see your, see your image better. It does not change your um, actual pixel intensities, okay? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think even with standard, we did not acquire this at high resolution. This was just acquired at standard. And even with standard, you're, you're, you know, the data looks pretty, pretty fine. Um, so if we switch between channels, um, fine, of yeah. course, it, it looks nice. Um, yeah, yeah it, it's not that bad. So no, no. I yeah. would say you don't need to acquire everything at high resolution. Uh, you can acquire using 20X at standard resolution and it will still do a good job for you. Okay, yeah. so that's that. This is all you need to know for what you need to do. Uh, so we will meet up tomorrow again at 10.30 and uh, we'll work on your samples. Sounds good? Yeah, sounds good. All right. Thank you so much for your patience with all those technical issues no, no, we were that's having. Fine. Um, and I was gonna ask like, can I 